I suffered something so terrible, and at the same time, I feel like I've won the lottery. I am now looking at life as just this absolute free do-over. Welcome to the StrokeCast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 60 of the StrokeCast. In this episode, we get to meet stroke survivor Peter Evans and his wife, Rhea. Peter survived a massive hemorrhagic stroke in 2017 that left him with cognitive challenges and partial vision loss. It turned his and Rhea's lives upside down. Their attitudes are really amazing, though. They've taken this horrible event and are determined to extract every piece of value from it that they can. Peter, with Rhea's support, is using his writing skills to drive increased support for stroke survivors. He's becoming a regular guest contributor to the StrokeCast blog. He's become a supporter and advocate for support groups, and Rhea is speaking out about the importance of advanced directives and other documentation so spouses and partners can most effectively support one another in times of crisis. Their attitudes towards one another are really special, though, and that comes across in today's conversation. In this episode, we do talk a little bit about finding Peter's skull. For those who are not familiar with the treatment, it's not uncommon in the treatment of stroke, especially hemorrhagic stroke, to have to remove part of the skull. In the case of a serious brain bleed, the blood can create additional pressure on the brain. Additionally, the trauma of the stroke can result in the brain swelling. This results in too much pressure on the brain tissue as it gets pressed against the skull. One way to relieve that pressure is a procedure called a craniectomy. It's where they remove part of the person's skull. When the swelling subsides, they can put that part of the skull back in place. Often, survivors who have temporarily had part of their skull removed will need to wear a custom helmet to help prevent other injuries. Longtime listeners may remember my conversation with Whitney Moran back at strokecast.com slash Whitney about her own experience with craniectomy and cranioplasty. 54-year-old Peter Evans, originally from Long Island, New York, currently resides in the Marina Del Rey section of Los Angeles, where he lives with his wife, Rhea, and an incredibly headstrong Yorkshire terrier they call Geronimo. Originally moving to L.A. to pursue a career as an actor, Peter eventually made the shift to corporate America, where he used his French language skills and traveled internationally as he worked as the project manager of a small international team where he helped launch the company's many international websites across Europe, Australia, and Japan. Peter continues to this day contributing online content for stroke resources and putting his years of project management to good use, paying it forward to all his fellow stroke survivors. Now, let's meet Peter and Rhea. So, Peter, thank you so much for joining us on StrokeCast today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And I understand you have a, a guest there in the room with you. I do. I have my wife, Rhea, sitting on side of me, who ever since the stroke happened, has become my right hand person. She's like my handler. I, what did I do before she helped me out? I don't know. Cause right now I feel like, you know, in many ways I'm better after my stroke than before. And a lot of it's because of her. So say hi, honey. Hello everyone. It's Rhea, the caretaker. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello Rhea. That is awesome. Our, our caretakers are often uh, are not nearly appreciated as much as they ought to be. So uh, welcome. I'm, I'm thrilled you're able to join us as well. Oh, thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> so Peter, you mentioned you weren't uh, sure how you got by uh, before the stroke without relying on Rhea as much as, as you do. So, I mean, what was your life like before you had your stroke? I was, I call myself a kind of a type A personality. I had a a highish a, a gre- degree of aggressiveness and pig-headedness, I'd even say. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I wasn't a person that people avoided because I was like, you know, some big pain in the butt. But I, I really was pretty driven. I look back now, and I, I just 
walk by so many wonderful things, not acknowledging them. And uh, I can't believe how today I feel as if the scales have fallen from my eyes. I mean, the blessings that I have around me are just too beautiful and too moving. It, I get emotional when I think about this new chance I've got because of the, the renewed relationship I, I have with Rhea and my newfound appreciation for life and all the great things that I still have. I don't focus on my deficits. I don't think like, you know, I'm fascinated by the fact that I'm completely blind in half of my field of vision on the left side. So I'm constantly doing these little parlor tricks to see my hand going into outer space when I put it to the left. But um, I, I'm, I'm really, really happy now. And I think back then I was probably missing a lot of things because I, I didn't take the time and the stroke really slowed me down and made me realize what was important because my, my wife, she really helped me through this. I mean, she, from, from when I, I was in a coma, uh, right after my stroke, I had a hemorrhagic stroke. I went to the gym one morning and, uh, I was doing some pull downs on the day and I thought, Ooh, it's all right. I, I don't feel good. I, I'll go, I'll go step on the treadmill and, uh, you know, walk this off a bit. And one step, two step, three. I was like, this, this isn't right. Something's not right. And it was as if like the voice of God was played, you know, like with a Morgan Freeman kind of voice was like, go to the front desk and tell them to keep an eye on you. Because if you fall down, you could really hurt yourself. I, I kind of knew like I, I could just, I was going to go down. And I went there. And of course, I say this to the front desk and they're looking at me like, what kind of crazy man are you? Do you want us to call 911? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm afraid. Yes, I, I think we have to call 911. And it just went downhill from then. And I mean, pain was crazy. I was having this hemorrhage in my brain. I had a hemorrhagic stroke. And... Um, I got to the hospital. I call up my wife. They're like, you know, they're like, you just got dropped off. You don't even have your wallet with you. We don't know who you are. So I'm like, oh, my God. And they're like, we're going to send you to County General. I'm like, holy cow. Not only that, you know. So I get on the phone. I call my wife. And I'm like, honey, uh, I, I'm, I got something to tell you. I'm, I'm in the emergency room. And then the, the phone is dead. The phone went dead, Bill. She didn't know, she didn't know where I was. And I'm there. And they're like. We're, you, if you don't get someone to, to vouch for who you are, you know, you're out of here. And this all the while on my head, it's like there's a vice grip on my head. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then, you know, I, I think I must have gone out for a while. And then I opened my eyes and I see someone sitting in this chair and I hear a voice go, hey, buddy, how's it going? And I'm like, who, who is that? Who's talking to me? And he goes, it's Roger, Roger from work. I'm like, oh, yeah, Roger. I mean, I was that out of it. Um, well, you know, like, let me say this. Well, how I was able to, uh, this is another sort of, I call it like, a, I call them mini miracles. So when Peter hung up, I had no idea where he was in the city. I knew that he had gone to the gym, and it was many miles away in tons of L.A. traffic. So um, I was able to get hold of one of his coworkers, but Peter had just started working there, and I had this vision to take down his number a few months before. So I was able to get hold of him, but I didn't know where Peter was. And I called the gym and it turns out that the one guy that knew the hospital that he went worked later that day. So he was able to tell me where Peter was. So um, from then on, it was uh, once we got over there, then Roger got over there. You know, I was thinking, Bill, well, okay, he went to the gym and he broke his ankle or, you know, he hurt his arm or, you know, you think something like that. And I get in there and Roger's looking at me, the doctor comes in and they're talking about brain surgery. And I'm like, ah. And they said, you know what? It's, it's the, but don't worry, it'll only take a month and so on and so on. So even that to take that in, I mean, to think about that, you leave in the morning and then it's brain surgery. And then it got worse during the course of the day. And then it became catastrophic. And then it was a nine and a half hour surgery. They said he, would, uh, he might die or spend the rest of his life in a coma. And they told me that news so fast, they told me it on the phone because I was in the ICU room and they had taken him downstairs. And I thought, oh my God. And they said, I said, please tell me more. And the surgeon said, I have to go. And he hung up. 
And that was the journey of from that morning. And then he had the nine and a half hour surgery until those. Uh, and then he was in a coma for quite a while and in a rehab hospital for 30 days. And it was slow, you know, I mean, it was really uh, intense and it was fast. You know, it was like the ground was just pulled out and the whole thing was just so shocking and terrifying. So, um, Priya tells me that because I, you know, I don't remember, I don't remember any of this. I, I have vague memories, and one thing I've noticed about the brain is when it doesn't have information, it kind of makes things up. Like my vision on the left, it kind of makes up what's actually over there. I, I realize, and and when my memory is is not there, or something I, something comes in, and I have to question myself. I'm like, is that actually what really happened? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so. Uh, she she helped. She was like taking care of all the doctors. And of course, when you're in a coma, you don't. It's not like you're no. dreaming. You don't remember anything. But I do have. I must have been just coming out of it. And I'm there in his bed, and I keep hearing this chapter from the audiobook of The Secret playing over and over in my head. And I said, "Oh my God, I'm in the hospital, and Rhea is playing this in my ears. I must really need it." And the story is about this guy who goes to the hospital and they tell him he's never going to be able to walk again. He'll only ever be able to blink his eyes and he'll be in a respirator the rest of his life. And I'm like, holy cow, I must be in some pretty bad shape right now. What went through my head. And I, that was my first thought. But my second thought was, and Rhea's there taking care of it. She's, she's there making sure that I'm listening to something that's putting the right, the right idea in my head. Like I've got to get out of some situation I'm in. Well, you know, Bill, too, what happened was it, during all the shock of it, then when Peter, after the nine and a half hours, and it was just all these tubes, and it just, he couldn't move at all. I mean, it was just like, is he going to make it? And what I told them was, they were like, well, it doesn't look good. And I said, don't talk like that. You know, like, let's keep it up. I said, because we really don't know. We're all individuals, individual thumbprint. And I tried to keep a really good energy in the room kept good music playing and let him listen to things. Cause I figured he's in a coma. He's not going to be saying, no, I'm not going to listen. And I just, I just kept it in the really. It, it's moment. like you finally get control of the TV remote. Yeah. Sure <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. And you know, when people would call, they, you know, they would be calling me and I would say to them, even though Peter was in a coma, I would say, no, I don't want you crying and all that crap. Just talk to him the way you would ask him to do things. Can you fix this? Can you do that? You know, just as if you were talking to him and he wasn't in a coma. So I felt that keeping that energy, and I think that that's really important. I mean, in any aspect of life. But um, Peter, I think, is a mere, well, I don't think he is compared to what he went through and what he is today. And this is just a little over a year ago. Um, so it's pretty amazing. He's really amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. You know, there's so much stuff in that story to unpack. Uh, I think, I think one of the things that, uh, strikes me is that as I talk with more and more survivors, so many of them, uh, describe themselves as feeling lucky because of the way things unfolded or because their stroke could have been so much worse or because of what they've seen coming out the other side. I, I can totally understand. I feel like uh, I've suffered something so terrible. And at the same time, I feel like I've won the lottery. I am now looking at life as just this absolute free do over. So as I'm putting myself back together and putting the parts of our life back together, I get to choose. So the crappy part that didn't work, you know what? I, we look at them together. Rhea and I, it's like, well, forget that. We don't need to do that anymore, you know? So it is an opportunity. And it's been, I mean, I, I'm, I'm telling you all the good parts. It's very, very hard. It's very painful. There's just so much worry and anxiety that this causes. Uh, not to mention, I'm a young guy. and it, in the middle of my earning years and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, not at work. And I'm anyway, sure. um, we, well, I mean, everybody's life gets turned upside down yeah. in an upside instant down. with this. Yes. 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 I mean, you know, when you wake up and suddenly your life, suddenly the next 40, 50, 60 years of your life now has to be completely rewritten. Yes. In a moment. Yes. yes. 
it is. It's a scourge, but I mean, it does. It's terrible, but not everything is terrible necessarily. Um, there, there are some things that actually are better now, mm-hmm. and that's what you have to focus on because that really is the choice, you know. Um, or you focus on because it just, you know, Bill, it, and I think as you know this, it really hits on every level. You know, it's emotional, it's financially devastating. Then you have to deal with family and friends. And I don't know if um, you've had an experience like this, but there are times like when I was dealing, you know, with people, they try to, um, it's out of a good space in their hearts, but it's sort of like, oh, I forget things too. And oh, you know what, that happens when you get older. Like, because it's, it's, people don't understand how, um, yeah, and the, and that's sort of the way that they make you feel better. And then some people just don't want to hear about it at all. Yeah, you know, so right. you do lose people too. It's like, nah, I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> so you know, there's a lot to to deal with on all levels. I think. But you really know, I'll say well. to that one of the things that I kind of consciously keep in my mind is that yes, it cannot be ignored. It is there. It has had an impact. And like you said, not all of it so terrible. Well, well, I think I think what's really interesting is, you know, definitely that whole, oh, you don't look so sick or yes. oh, I forget things, too. It all comes from a good place from folks who just yes. really don't understand. And I mean, e- even when I look back on it now and you, know, you start encountering I, I'm almost two years post stroke now. But the idea of. You know, for example, just the way neuro fatigue sometimes hits me, yes. whether that's been from walking or just in the afternoon when I hit that wall. And I never knew that kind. And, and I mean, I've been sleep deprived for big parts of my life. I've gone 36 hours and then had to sleep. But, you know, it's a, such a completely qualitatively different kind of tired that you just can't understand. Yes, 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 yes. absolutely. I think I wrote that in one of my blog posts. I was like, you know, be kind to yourself. And if you need, if you feel tired, take a nap. <laughs> That's like one of the biggest bits of advice to anyone who's new in stroke is make sure you get rest. I mean, that when, when you work out, for example, you do all this destruction of your muscles in the gym, but it's when you sleep that you rebuild the muscles. And it's when you sleep that you reconsolidate um, memories and, and brain function it's just so important to give yourself enough rest. Absolutely. One of the things I like to describe it as is, you know, sometimes they shut down the freeway at night. The freeway is not doing nothing at night. That's the only time they can tear up the pavement and rebuild it. And that's what's happening to the brain in sleep. It's getting torn up and rebuilt in a better way. What a great metaphor. I love Absolutely. that. Oh, Absolutely. my God. That is great. The major yeah. work goes on while you're yes. sleeping. Yes, absolutely. So true. the The other thing that I think is really critical to take away from your story, uh, and that it applies to survivors and folks who haven't had a stroke or really any other thing yet, is that whole issue you had with not having your wallet or not having your ID. Oh my and god! And because they didn't have information about you, they were just going to throw you out on the street or transfer you to a different facility. That is absolutely terrifying something that should not happen and is something you know we all need to do to keep in mind to prevent that and if you are a survivor or have other medical conditions make sure you have that information on you at all times if that means you know even a neck packet that you're wear at the gym or wherever that stuff is just so important yes you know absolutely here, uh Here's a tip for, for everyone who's there listening out, out in the cyber world. The other thing that we really came to understand was it's so important to have advanced directives and uh, ability for your, you know, your trusted spouse or whomever to, to be able to make decisions for you. Because I was in a coma and we had to close on three different properties, which they, you know, it was like, how are we going to make this happen? And then the, uh, uh, her making decisions about my medical well-being was kind of in question. And it, have that in order. Make yeah. sure you have uh, whatever powers of attorney that you need and make sure you keep your insurance card with you. You know, another thing, Bill, I would add to that because I've helped out many. I just have told all my friends, 
So another what I call mini miracle with Peter was when it went from bad to worse, he was downstairs getting an MRI and I was up in the uh, ICU in the room. So what we thought was we were going to push this minor brain surgery mm. faster. But then as it turned out, it was catastrophic and they couldn't, you know, that it became an emergency. Fortunately, Peter was coherent enough to say to the head, uh, the surgeon that was going to do it, the doctor said, I'm going to need to, can you give me permission? Peter was uh, coherent enough, at least for those few minutes to do that. Had he not been, I did not have power of attorney. And another thing I want to tell people is the paperwork is free online. All you have to do is get it notarized. Get it notarized and that's like $10. But I think it's very important because you don't know when those kind of situations come up and I've given it to so many of my friends and they're all like, thank you. I never thought about that. But just think about that. If he hadn't been, that was another one, coherent enough to say before he passed out again, yes, you have permission. You know, who knows? Do you know what I mean? So so those things are very important. Absolutely. And we'll link over to some of that that paperwork over at strokecast.com slash meet Peter. Well, they go there, everybody, and download it and fill it out. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, So, I mean, that's... A tremendous experience to go through not that long ago. So, I mean, you mentioned some challenges with memory. What sort of deficits are you working with today? So um, the one that I mentioned at the top, at the top is, is the, the vision. So the left side, you know, it, it's gone. Um, and they took my license away, which really upset me. <laughs> not that I plan on driving, but anyway, I was sort of bummed out about that. The other deficits are, oh gosh, it's... There's memory issues that are very bizarre. It's uh, they sent me for what do you call it a neuropsych evaluation after I had had my head put the skull put back together and everything, and they assured me they said no you're not going crazy this is where you had the injury in your brain it's normal that you would be having these another weird deficit I have is did I say this one already <laughs> is that uh, my spatial reasoning is completely mm-hmm. messed up. I can't, I, I go down the hall and I don't remember where the, the offices that I just came from. That's a real bummer because I used to be a person who could find myself anywhere. Mm-hmm. And I think too, Bill, it's the executive functioning yeah. that really, I mean, and now we're seeing it now that we're doing, you know, work. It's, it's, it's really deep. I have to rely on my wife now. I, she, I partner with her in so much stuff because I'm, 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 I'm articulate and all that sort of stuff, but there's some executive function there that uh, I, I see it. I can, that's, a, that's a terrible decision or I, I'm not thinking clearly. So I have to, I have to be less arrogant. I have to be more partnering. Um, and that's how I feel I can cope better and know that I'm not making really horrible decisions. It's interesting how uh, essentially you end up outsourcing some parts of your brain that you used to be able to do directly. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you know we were just uh, talking about it yesterday, my wife and I. She's like, yeah. She goes, here. I, I noticed it. She goes, you things that you you know that get you befuddled or take you forty five minutes to do, you did in two minutes before. And I'm and she says, I see it, but she she's there to step in if I'm. I'm um, having a little trouble. She she helps me out all the time. Uh, so, so Ria, how do you, how do you manage this extra workload? Because I mean, obviously, you've got all of you know everything just going on in your own head and your own life, and now you've got all this other extra medical stuff to help coordinate, and some of these things that uh, Peter I- isn't able to do effectively today. You know, I think uh, what happens is it's amazing what you what you can do and and I really think it comes down to you know your attitude about how you're going to take it on and when there were other things and I, I just want to share with people make sure you have those things in order your health and your power of attorney in case you need things because when the whole thing slammed down then I had to do all the medical things and some of them you know I had to wait and all that stuff it is very difficult. And then I didn't have care at home. So when Peter came home after 
He was in the coma then he went a, uh, a month in a rehab. Well, he didn't have half of his skull. So I wasn't able to get any at-home uh, assistance. So you can imagine that like every night I was like, oh my God, because if he fell, you had half the skull wasn't there. And then um, it, it really did take a lot and it, in addition to all the other operations. Well, the other thing too is that because of his emergency situation, he had to go outside of our medical group. So that was a whole other big thing, but they had part, they had his skull at one hospital. And then when we got back into our system, I said, please, because you know, I'm kind of the person that gets things done. And I, the, the one, they called me from our current medical system and they're like, okay, so do you know where the skull is? And I'm like, don't tell me I got to go over there with the cooler and some beers and try to find the skull in the other hospital. Because <laughs> so, they needed to do the cranioplasty on him, right. you know? And I'm like, oh my God, like, is this? It's a, and I tried to make light of it, you know, have some humor with it. She didn't find it funny. So she didn't <laughs> laugh. I was like, ha ha, don't you think? She's like, you won't be coming over here with your cooler and your, and your peers to get this skull from our facility. And I was like, oh, okay, ha, ha, ha. So then it ended up, uh, so it's things like that that you have to think about that you have to deal with one of many other things. But we did get the skull issue resolved. They ended up putting something really great in it. Yeah, it is a what did, lot. What did you say, but, that, like, just based on what you're saying, definitely you have a great ability to keep a sense of humor of things, even things when they look morbid. Fine. Yeah, yeah, and I just kind of, and if I didn't understand what the doctors were saying, I said, can you say that in three simple sentences that a normal person can understand? <laughs> you know, can you just do me that? And then anytime they said something I didn't want to hear, because really, my feeling was, there is no 100%. I'm like, can you, it's not like, you know, oh, the leg is broken, and here's the bone, and here's how it's going to heal. This is the brain. They really didn't know. People, like, Here's probably what's going to happen, but I'm like, no, I don't want to hear that. This is a thumbprint. He still is an individual. There still is hope. And I knew I had a feeling that Peter was listening. I've always believed that people that are unconscious have some way they're hearing something. I don't know why I think that, but I do. <laughs> well, so, well, I mean, all of that data is still going into the ears. I mean, the brain's prime. One of the things the brain spends the most of its time doing is eliminating data and ignoring stuff coming in through our eyes and our ears right. and our nose to right. handle the information. But you know, in a coma or unconscious, there's parts of the brain that are still functioning and may still be processing that data in some way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm now a. Uh, uh, fascinated student of the brain these days. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I make myself into my own experiment. I, I'm constantly um, just observing how my memory works around something, or I'll observe how, here's a trick I do to myself. I just look at my eyesight and I look straight ahead and I have 50% the left field is not there. So I'll look to my left and Rita's sitting to my left and I look at her, okay? And now I look straight ahead, I'm looking at the computer, I'm talking to you, but I still see Rhea to the left a little bit. That, that, that's cool. I thought I couldn't see to the left. But what I do is I put my hand up in front of her face and I'm still looking forward. I can see her, but I can't see my hand. So clearly I don't see her face. I see like this past impression of her face is, is, in, is, is put there by my brain. I'm not actually mm -hmm. seeing her. I'm remembering her. Does that make any sense? It's very weird. To me. That makes a that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. And in some respects, this goes back to uh, I'm going back to my 1990s selling inkjet printer days. Wh one of the things we used to talk about was interpolated data, yeah. where it doesn't necessarily have a pixel, but a computer or a printer would go ahead and guess at what that pixel should be to give you a full image. And it sounds like that's sort of what the brain is doing. It's interpolating. It knows what's supposed to be there, even though it isn't. So it's just going to give you that interpolated image. Absolutely. Yes. It is a construct. Our, what we think we see is not always exactly what we see. The brain is putting things together. And they say that the brain does that, that very same thing with memories. Because when you recall memory, it gets put into a kind of a, you know, this working memory area. And when it gets put back, if you've made changes to it, that memory from two years ago is now slightly different. So it's amazing. All these things we think of, it's, oh, it's like a computer. It's, you know, you know, 
Mm. It's either ones or zeros. It's not. There's a lot of interpolation that the brain does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the other thing you mentioned there was so important, too, about being able to take a sense of humor to this and figure out, you know, where the skull is and, <laughs> and just being able to joke about this. I remember when I was in the hospital uh, sharing with some folks that uh, rolling over as a stroke survivor was harder than rolling over a 401k. <laughs> and, that is yeah. so funny. <laughs> so... You know, and and half and you know, and half the people I I talk to would be horrified at that, and the other half would think it was hysterical. <laughs> yeah, I used I got those reactions too, and I think when you know when you asked me about being the caretaker, I think dealing with a situation that is as difficult as Peter's was, um, I think a sense of humor, and my God, you have to have faith, like whatever that is, you know, you, or however you. Do that. You kind of resist going way down into the deep, dark places because, because it's, they can really, they yeah, can, they can just put the absolute brakes on on your improvement and recovery. And I have a predisposition to sort of going down into the dumps. Uh, and Rhea's like she's my uh, guardian. She's like, <laughs> no, you're not going down there. <laughs> so if, I told that to my mom. She goes, oh yeah, it's sort of like tough love. I'm like, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Well, yeah. Great. Well, that's that's one of the things I wanted to talk about too, because Peter, you've written about depression as a guest on the Strokecast blog. So, yeah. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, your experience with post-stroke depression. I know it is incredibly common, and it is something that a lot of survivors deal with or ought to be dealing with. Yeah, it's incredibly common. I've become much more um, educated on stroke because of the the groups that I go to. And um, I would say quite easily over 50% of those people there are, are suffering from clinical depression. And <clears throat> I mean, depression, you know, has a lot of stigma, but it, it, you have to let that go. It's your brain. That's where your emotions are. And it's the very organ that has been severely damaged. I mean, it's a traumatic injury. And um the most important thing, step number one, is to recognize it's not a failing. It's it's not nothing. It's it's there. It happens to everybody. I mean, everybody gets some degree of anxiety or depression after stroke because there's a there's an element that's in some respects like PTSD. I mean, you're really coming back from a very 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 difficult injury and your partner, your, your, your caregiver, your spouse, I mean, goes through that with you when you're there in the hospital and in a coma. Um, so don't, don't, don't just sit on it, you know, and I, I'll, I'll say this too. It may sound morbid, but I mean, like if there's anyone listening who can identify with it and it's more than just a fleeting thought of, of, you know, Oh, it would be better if I was dead. Don't, 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 don't brush that off. Talk to people because you have to, you have to take care of yourself. You have to make sure that you take care of yourself. You're counting on you. And um, thinking about hurting yourself is not acceptable. You've got to, you've got to talk it out. You've got to get help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the um, uh, Star Trek fans are probably familiar with actor Will Wheaton. Uh, who is also very public in talking about, he's not a stroke, not connected with stroke, but he's been very public in talking about his battles with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And he raises the point that depression lies to you. So it's your brain telling you things when it's giving, telling you things you're not worth, you're not worth anything. You're a burden on other folks. It'd be, everybody would be better if you're gone. Depression is lying to you. But the hairs on my arm are standing up. It's, it's so true. Somebody said it once before, and I repeated to myself, don't believe everything you think. You know, your brain will tell you things that, or as I wrote in some other blog article, I said, you know, there are as many versions of the truth as there are people observing it. And even the same person can observe it 10 different ways. It, you know, don't, don't go for just the, 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 
the worst one first. There are other ways to look at life. And don't think that this horrible feeling is the only the only truth. And don't ever fall into the trap of thinking like it's permanent. It'll never get better. No feeling is ever permanent. Absolutely. Just like the good times don't always last, the bad times don't either. Right. Right. Totally. That's right. So, I mean, what would what would you say is sort of the biggest misconception that folks without stroke have about survivors? Um, well, the first thing is I think everybody, I included when I started, thinks it's, you know, it's for your grandparents, people who are in their 80s uh -huh. and whatnot. There are people in my, in my group, I mean, they're in their 20s. Yeah. I mean, there are people who are parents who are, uh, who are young, people who are still living at home with their – it, it is an equal opportunity offender. So don't be ashamed about talking about it. Um, it. It happens to a lot of people, and it's not an indictment on you. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's, it's just happening to more and more people. It happens to younger and younger people. Bill, you know what I've noticed, uh, you know, sort of being on the, um, another, from another perspective, the biggest thing that I see is denial. Mm -hmm. When I say denial, I kind of want you to think about, you know, do you remember a time way back, probably before our time, when people were like, oh, those alcoholics, but it didn't exist. Do you know what I mean? There was sort mm -hmm. of... I sort of see there is an awakening, but there's a denial, and it's like, oh, that just happens to old people. Oh, yeah, that happens to me, too. Oh, you know, there's always that sort of uh, yeah. thing about it. You know, I think it's opening up now, and I think with Luke Perry, you know, with, with God bless, oh, yeah, God you know, bless you. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, people are beginning to see it more, but there is sort of that, I don't know if you felt it or noticed it, but that's what I noticed is, is there's a lot of that. Now, I think it is getting better. Uh, yeah, but, but it's there. Celebrity awareness is helping a lot. You know, folks yeah. like, you know, obviously Luke Perry, a terrible situation, but mm -hmm. hopefully it inspires some folks to go ahead and get their, you know, double check their own blood pressure and get, you know, get themselves checked out and, and realize it happens. We just had the uh, news come out. Oh, I'm blanking on her name. So I'm really going to have to link to this. But the uh, actress from Game of Thrones who plays Khaleesi, you know, oh, she was yeah. just talking about her aneurysm and her stroke basically right after they wrapped season one of Game of Thrones. And she had a second one uh, mm. after that. And she just wrote an amazing article about it, I think, for the New York Times. So, I mean, this is greater awareness is helping. Yes. There still needs to be more of that. Not that I want more people, more famous people coming out in the same way. But, uh, but there needs to be more awareness that this can happen. Yes, yes, yes. You know what, Bill? I just am thinking right now, uh, another part that's really scary is that it can happen again, mm. you know, and it's not like, oh, hey, it's a done deal, you know, get up, you know, your broken arm is better and all that stuff. That's sort of like, we don't know enough about the brain, you know, we know a lot about heart and heart attack and all that stuff, but we just haven't been studying the brain that long. It's only been the last 20 years, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of my point there. <laughs> but, uh, well, well, you know, I think the other thing that's interesting, too, you talked about earlier how some folks can't deal with it and, and back away from it. Yeah. The other part of it is, I think, especially as younger survivors, we scare people. Yeah, oh, scare yes. People. I didn't even think about this that. This could Absolutely. happen to me. But, you know, I, I was in physical therapy, and we saw this young guy who oh, must have yeah. been... I don't know, 19 years old, and he had the head, um, what do you call it, hemiparesis, and it, it was just heartbreaking. I mean, there's there's just a lot of young people. There's a lot of people in their 20s in my group. It's it's an equal opportunity yeah. offender. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as I've encountered more people through this program, 
we've gotten to, you know, you start to hear how it impacts people's, uh, people's experiences and, you know, folks in their twenties from students to actors to, oh, yeah. you know, just whatever they're pursuing and how it changes it. And then how it changes the course of people's lives. Um, you know, we had a, uh, you know, I talked to, uh, Whitney Moran a number of years ago, uh, a number of months ago, and she's now after her, uh, experience of surviving her hemorrhagic stroke is now, uh, pursuing her degree in rehab psychology. Um, oh, cool. It's, yeah, it's pretty awesome. She is, she's, she's awesome to talk to. Uh, Maggie Whittem, who is an actress in Denver, has turned it into advocacy for, uh, folks with disabilities in the arts and is producing her own film uh, about the impact of of stroke survival and chronic pain and managing all of that to again raise additional awareness and seeing what people are doing with these experiences to transform and alter the direction of their lives. Yeah, you're reminding me of someone in one of our stroke survivor meetings where I don't remember what it was in response to, and he said, you know. You can't just stop living. You've got your whole life to, mm-hmm. to keep living, you know? And a lot of times there's a big tendency for people in the face of this to withdraw. You don't you don't do yourself any favors by doing that. You don't do the world any favors by doing that. I mean, we we need everybody back in the game. And there's still more game to be played. I mean, maybe you're playing a slightly different game or maybe you're doing it with, you know, I don't know a little, little help of something on your hand or something walker in front of you. But I mean, there's still a lot more life to be lived and uh, that there are some things that can be better. My marriage is better. My wife has said, I'm a different person. I'm kinder. I'm more generous. I, you know, I'm more present. Uh, and I'm God, I am more grateful. I just don't take anything for granted anymore. Well, that is fantastic. And, and you mentioned some of the folks you've been meeting through your local groups. I mean, what, what's been your experience with with the stroke support groups, either online or just in your area? I, I'm I'm amazed. I am just inspired. I, I you know, my my wife she calls up for me. She calls up. She goes, "Oh, group, you know, we saw your thing in the paper. Where you have the stroke meeting or whatever." Um, and uh, you know. Can, can we come? When's your next one? You know, do you need to like get accepted into the group or anything? They're like, no, there's one tomorrow. And when we went there, uh, I was I was so nervous. I thought, oh my god, mm. I am absolutely going to be the youngest person there. And because I don't have as many visible defects, I'm like, they're going to be like, what are you doing here? You're fine. Get out of here. <laughs> and I tell you, we were like on some kind of brand new drug or something. We we're just <laughs> on it. We were in heaven. I couldn't believe how inspired I was by all these people with all varying degrees of deficits mm-hmm. and at really different points in their in their recovery path. And I was like, look at all these these marvelous people. Yeah. I mean, if if anyone's listening and hasn't been to a survival group, uh, you don't know what you're missing. You don't know what you're missing because it it is so reaffirming to see how many people are going on with their lives and having happy times still and uh, learning great coping mechanisms and um, really active participants in the game of life, not sitting out. You know, uh, Bill, too, I want to add, when we found uh, the meeting, it was mentioned, just um, one of our doctors mentioned it, and he's like, he kind of was putting something aside. He goes, you know, they have stroke support group and it's here and, you know, not too far away. And, but we didn't get any information at that time, but what had happened was like, it was after a month or two had passed, like since Peter had been home and things were not looking good. And we didn't really have anybody other than family and friends that was really had this experience. And then I said, oh, I remember that the doctor said, so I went online and I looked it up and I found a newspaper article and I, I, and it said, call this number. And I was like, okay, but whoever answers the phone, she answered the phone. And, and she was like, and I was like, hello. I said, now I got this from blah, blah, blah. And I, and I said, so can, can we, can we, 
come to the group? And she said, has he had a stroke? I said, yes. <laughs> she goes, you're in. And I'm like, when? She goes, tomorrow. And it was life-changing, just like Peter said, because you get to see people from all walks of life. And a lot of the people that are going through it. Also, I got to see other caregivers. Yeah. And, you know, you'd be surprised how, well, I'm sure you know, how devastating it is on families. And, God, I remember this one guy said, um, he looked and he looked at me and Peter and he said, you know what? He said to Peter, you're really lucky. He goes, when I have my stroke, my wife said, when is he going to be better? When he's going to be back to what he was, normal again. normal again. And she divorced him within six months. She was wow. just like, I'm out yeah. of here. Yeah. And then we've seen, you know, with some of our caretakers who, like, there's a mother who wants to take care of her son. who had, And it's just heartbreaking how young he is. And that's going to be the rest of her life because he's only in his 20s. And then we see some people with just tremendous depression. But the most important thing is that they come to the group. Yeah. I think any way that someone can reach out, even if it's just you're going online, uh, reaching out to yeah. a stroke and support I, I online. I don't know what the mechanism. I don't know what the mechanism is, is of the group, but it's something there just by being there, just yeah. by sharing a story and hearing other people's. It's it's life affirming. It's really, it's reinvigorating. It's like, oh gosh, there is hope that their life does go on and look at all these people who yeah. have been through strokes and oh, I look how good they're doing. Yeah, so that's what, and even if, like I said, any step that a person can take, it's online, that you're able to get, if there are some groups, you know, in your area, whatever it is that you can do, making that effort really makes a difference. Even if you're not thinking that it's making a difference, you can feel it. Yeah, absolutely. There's tremendous power in community, in being heard, yeah. and in recognizing that you are not alone. You're yes. not alone. The, the other thing that you mentioned that I really want to point out here is you mentioned that you were almost afraid to go to the group. It's like, are they going to kick you out because you're not, quote unquote, bad enough? I think that's something that can really happen, especially with stroke is that we have to deal with this imposter syndrome. Yes. yes. And, and I know Joe and Lauren talked about that on the NeuroNerds podcast a couple months ago as well. But we think that, are we really disabled enough? Is our condition really serious enough? Are people going to judge us? And the answer mm -hmm. is, go. It's a very welcoming community, and you need support. And, you know, you're yes, you've had a stroke. You've had a brain injury. You're, you're in the club. The yeah. teams suck, but it's filled with really awesome people. Yes, yes. Yes, that's right. That's so true. God, that really is true. And once you get there, you're, you're going to love it. We'll pick it out. And, and they've got great personalities. Everybody's really, it's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. They're great environments. I, I can't say enough good things about them. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, so, Peter and Rhea, it's been great chatting with you uh, today. If folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Well, I'm not terribly, terribly social media, but I do have um, uh, a page in LinkedIn, which I monitor um, regularly. Whereas if you try and I have, I have uh, text messages from people on Facebook that I haven't answered in two years. <laughs> so I wouldn't I wouldn't do that route. But um, I, I'm happy to, you know, if someone sends me a message uh, through LinkedIn, I'm very happy to reply back if they want. Or if they just want to know more about me and what I do, uh, uh, they can see my page. Fantastic. And we will link to that over at uh, strokecast.com slash meet Peter. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Bill. It's you, been wonderful Bill. chatting with you. And that brings us to our hack of the half week. Accept help. Accept help. Um... I, we did a whole big round robin multiple times in these different groups we were at, and everybody to a person was a type A control freak before stroke. And, and they, they now are, they're, they're welcoming collaboration and help, and they don't have to be in charge of absolutely everything. Um, and they don't have to hold themselves up to these unrealistic expectations. Be kind to yourself. That's what I really think. And another thing, I, I tend to be kind of, oh, pig-headed, stubborn. Uh, I can have a touch of arrogance or something. And another thing is, just don't fight. Just stop it. I mean, if someone's telling you something th that you don't agree with, 
it's probably true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, my, if my wife mentions something, she's like, oh, you did this, or we saw that, or whatever. I'm like, no, we didn't. You know, and now I'm, I'm saying, now my knee-jerk reaction to just argue is like, you know, she didn't have massive brain injury, so I'll, I'll take her word for it. I hope you can find the same level of inspiration in Peter and Rhea's lives as I do. It's a powerful statement about taking a situation, regardless of how bad it is, and finding the good in it. You may have noticed that this episode is coming out earlier in the week than normal. Over the next few months, I plan to increase my posting frequency as I work with some additional content contributors. I think we'll be hearing from Peter again. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the additional content as well. You can post in the comments at strokecast.com slash meetpeter or email bill at strokecast.com. What do you think about Peter and Rhea's story? Let us know in the comments over at strokecast.com slash meetpeter. Check out Peter's Strokecast article by visiting strokecast.com slash peter. Subscribe to Strokecast in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And of course, as always... Don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Strokecast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.